All right, I think we got it. I will begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for your students. It's pretty help us today to uh, say some meaning, meaningful things about uh, algebraic topology. Lord, your name I pray. Amen. So we are um, just on the cusp of discussing simplicial homology. Um, so let me write down a few things here. Um, so I won't write this down, but an, an oriented simplicial complex K is a simple a simplicial complex in a partial order on the vertices of K, whose restriction to the vertices of any simplex in K is a linear order. All right. Um, every linear ordering of the vertices makes K into an oriented simplicial <coughs> complex. For every simplicial complex K, the barycentric subdivision, SDK, is always oriented. C exercise. Ooh. That's I, mean. I, should, I should make your final just... I don't know, I just feel like I want all the exercises ever, ever in this book. Just give me a complete solution manual. There you go, final project. That required very little thinking on my part. I will not be publishing a solution. <laughs> Dear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, am I joking? I don't know. Um, I'm just joking at the moment. For now. It is, of course, a good idea to do exercises. Um, definition. So here we go. So we define the uh, homology groups of oriented simplicial complexes K. Eventually we'll see that they coincide with the homology groups of the underlying space and hence are independent of the or partial order on the vertices of K. So here's the definition. I'm kind of excited about some of the stuff in today's lecture because it's linear algebra. Let's see here. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, if, K, if K is an oriented simplicial complex And all these oriented simplicial complexes look the same. Uh, oriented simplicial complex. And Q is greater than or equal to zero. Let CQ K be the Gabelian group Gabelian group um, having the following presentation all right so what are the rules generators Generators are all Q plus one tuples of what? Um, vertices, basically, right? Convert to K such that what? What are the rules? P0, P1, spans A simplex in K. Alright. Um, <clears throat> relations. What are the relations? The relations are one of oh, I mean, yeah. got my number and off relations one if some vertex is repeated if there exists you know pi equal to pj for i not equal to j right that might be, I don't know. Familiar. That, that might be a violation of his other notation, too. He just says the vertex is repeated. This formula is mine. But, <laughs> two. Yeah, it is familiar, isn't it? Um, two. Um, P naught, P1 dot PQ is equal to the sine of pi, sine of permutation pi, 
and here we're looking at pi, uh, p of pi pi of 0, p of pi 1, p of pi cube, where of course pi is a permutation of 0, 0, 1, da 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 q. Um, denote the element of CK, CQK corresponding to, uh, so basically <coughs> the, the, the element represented by the that tuple we'll use brackets for. So elements in the presentation, we're going to write P0, P1, PQ for the element. I'm going to stop repeating myself. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a typical element of C. <coughs> QK? Okay. Um, So what does he get then? One uh, C Q K is a free billion group. the basis. <coughs> basis P naught P1 to that uh, PQ where P naught PQ does what? Spans a simplex Hi Daniel. Hi. I just want to say that is a really cool shelf up there. Thank you. Nice the card. Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> the best you. office ever. Uh, thank you. you. Any office with money and top is cool. So. <laughs> <coughs> it's the danger of having an office in engineering. Let's see here. Spans it. Is it is that someone you actually know? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Did you know him or no? No, I don't know him at all. <laughs> he does like Star Wars a lot. Ah, it's acceptable. Let's see here. Um, where was I? Oh yes. Uh, so this spans a uh, Q simplex and K and. Um, I don't know if I really want all this detail. Anyway, P naught is less than P1, less than PQ. Remember, we got that ordering to play with here. And, you know, all that, that this ordering stuff is really just bookkeeping for what follows on the next page. He explains CKQ equals zero for all Q greater than M. The M is, let K be simplex of dimension M oriented simplicial complex of dimension M to be more specific. Now, so the, we have this lemma and um, the proof appears to just be pretty standard like a, you know Z linear algebra if you will. Um, he basically forms a basis that's built around using the ordering which is given, strings things together, and is able to argue that that's a free billion group with that basis. Let me get to the punchline here. So definition, uh, we can define partial Q, which is a mapping from the Q CK, CQK to CQ minus 1K. How do we do it? And this is this is I think this is my uh, 
now we're starting to get to my happy place mm -hmm. in a, an actual formula. Uh, P1, uh, P, PQ. <coughs> start to understand the comment my brother's student made when studying this book last semester. What's that? He couldn't connect it to anything else he'd ever done. <laughs> I mean, that's not, I mean, I don't, that's not how I feel, actually. I mean, I know this stuff. Really, it's just, it's, sometimes it seems so out there. I need, I need, uh, at some point I need something, the abstraction wears on me at some point. And this is not, I mean, there's much more abstract stuff than this even, you know? It's a thing. Oh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I was thinking I was writing over here because I'm an idiot. Anyway, so this is a definition of, uh, what should we call this thing? The boundary map, I suppose. Yeah. And so what he's, it's the alternating sum, deleting the i -th, um, I vertex, right? And then you extend linear, extend by linearity. And then the theorem we get from this contract, I guess I can write here, theorem, um, which is that if K is an oriented simplicial complex of a dimension N, um, then C star K equals to zero. Then you've got CM, K, um, da, 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 C1, C1, K. I've started too close to the corner, I regret this. <laughs> CK, ah, I think I made it work. This is the boundary, boundary, boundary. Um, so if you have an oriented simplicial complex of dimension N, then that is a chain complex. Um, he says, proof, the argument of theorem 4.6 can be used here um, to show that boundary, boundary. So basically, by the arguments we went through before, it's still the case that the boundary times the boundary is, is equal to zero, and that gave us that previously, back in chapter 4. Patterns the same basically here. just by analogy to yeah. this construction being essentially the same as the um, construction for singular homology. Right, right, yeah, exactly. And so you will not be surprised when I define <laughs> uh, ZQ, uh, the, the, the cycles, the boundaries, Q boundaries, Q cycles, and the Q homology group of the oriented simplicial complex according to the kernel the image make sure my counting's right Q plus one and of course right oh no way come on <laughs> So the simplicial, simplicial Q cycles, <laughs> simplicial Q boundaries, <coughs> and the Q simplicial <coughs> homology group. All right. um, definition: If we have K and L oriented simplicial complexes, all right, and if phi is a what if he goes from k to l is a simplicial map then we can define this guy this induced map on the uh, what are these things called what should I call this CQ are these the chains I mean, this is the analog of the singular chains, right? Mm -hmm. These are the simplicial Q chains, I guess. Um, it doesn't seem to give them a name anywhere, unless I missed it. Um, isn't this just the induced map? 
Oh yeah, this is the induced. Um, yeah, this, this is the induced. Oh, oh, okay. Admittedly, this is the induced map. Absolutely, that 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 that, 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 that amount of name calling is there. Absolutely. Um, okay, so so you define it just like we did before, I suppose. Notice this seems like deja vu all over again to me. I can't quite remember where. It's my own stupid fault for not doing exercises, though. Let's see here. PQ. So that gives us the uh, so called induced map. And um, he says his lemma, his next lemma, basically says this the induced map. Uh, commutes with the boundary map like so. So the commute we can move, and then that then is the big mover and shaker in the proof that um, this we define a natural functor from category of oriented simplices, I guess to the category of abelian groups. And um, he's back to his old he's back to his old habits again. Um, <laughs> so phi star phi star is such that Z plus the Q boundary uh, K maps to the induced map phi acting on Z plus B Q L. So the uh, that's the what's that? That's the how to say it. It's also the induced map. <laughs> oh, it's also the induced map. Well, I lose anyway. Okay, so great. He says one wants to promote the definition of simplicial homology functors to the subcategory top of polyhedra. One problem is the definition of f star when f is a continuous map. Plainly, the simplicial approximation theorem will be useful, and this will force comparison of the Q-thomology group of the simplicial complex and the Q-thomology group of the barycentric subdivision of K. Um, he says this complication is one reason we presented the singular theory first. Um, so here's the kind of the big, well, I don't know if this is the big theorem, but it's a big theorem. theorem. I mean, this is, these are pretty nice results, right? Let K be a finite oriented. I, you know, in a given semester, I would say, um, I think I get about 10 people just randomly walk in the office and say, like, have to share their love of Star Wars Legos with me. Like, it just, it, just, it happens. <laughs> Usually not students I know either, just like random people who like, is that? And then when they could see the tower, then I would get the people with the, you know, who love the Lord of the Rings Legos, but their, their number is dwindling. <laughs> it's out of the limelight now, you know. Um, well, finite oriented simplex dimension N, M as in money. Uh, then you got three things. One, you've got the H. The Q homology group over K is a finitely generate is finitely generated. Finitely generated. Two. Um, the Q homology groups of the simplicial complex are zero when you've got Q greater than M. Three. You know, just on the surface of things. It makes you believe that it should have something to do with differential forms, you know? Hmm. Like yeah. this, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's pretty much like the dual theory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Indeed. That is, yeah, that is, it is different. It is a free, free abelian, um, possibly zero. That's for fixed, that's for M, that's for the top. Right. 
that's for the top. <coughs> Q equal to M. Um, he's not asserting that it does not equal to zero. He says that could be false. Um, so he says this defines the absolute simplicial homology groups. K an oriented simplicial complex and L a subcomplex. L is also oriented in the induced orientation, and you can get a partial order on vert L inherited from vert K. And it's easy to see that the uh, let's say the Q chains on L are a sub form a subgroup of the Q chains at, based on K, and you get that the complex of L is a subcomplex of the complex of K. And then you can define the relative simplicial homology groups, much like we did before. Right, so that's that's pretty cool. I'll write those things down. Um, <clears throat> this I will write down. So you guys are aware that really the origins of topology probably if you want to trace them back, maybe go to this formula. I mean, maybe this is the is this the first place topology is seen? I don't know. But spoiler, <laughs> I mean, earlier is kind of been. <coughs> it's pretty old, right? Mm -hmm. Euler's formula, stupid Euler. What did he do? Mm -hmm. um, v minus E plus F equals to 2, right? Now let's see here, what is V? V is the number of vertices. E is the number of edges, right? And F is the number of faces of what? Of the simplex. This is this is this this well so, of the simplex. So, so this holds well. So like this is for um, simplicial complexes of dimension two, I believe. I think that's right. Um, it holds for the platonic solids. So like the tetrahedron, the dodecahedron, the octahedron, the... Like dimension three. Is it dimension three? But the... Uh, oh, five plus... Well, maybe the skeleton of those is... Hmm. Well, well, it holds for any plane graph. Well, this holds for oh, any... So maybe, okay, so no, yeah, it's like... <clears throat> so complexes that are like they only have like complex of dimension two. But well, this, with that, you can make like a tetrahedron. Right. He said this holds for any triangulation of S two. So all the platonic solids can be inscribed inside a sphere. Right. Right. I mean, Kepler's been. But that's also an equivalent way of describing plane graphs, which are. Okay. Um, Essentially, um, vertices and edges where the edges yeah. don't cross in the plane. Ah. And then you treat, you know, by the Jordan curve theorem, the um, regions that divides the sphere and or plane into are the faces. Ah. Cool. Huh. You see, I mostly know this, um, like, for example, studying... Uh, um, Classical differential geometry, the Gauss Binet theorem relates the Euler characteristic of a surface to the total curvature. Um, I mean, that is the Gauss Binet theorem. <laughs> and um, so this is an interesting quantity. It's, it's, uh, but anyway, he, he, now we're going to generalize it like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, he said basically what you're going to see is that this is nothing more than the alternating sum of Betty numbers, the rank of the uh, homology groups of different order and together and, uh, <coughs> with appropriate and let's say anti-symmetrization I guess. So here's the Euler the uh, Euler definition. Euler Poincare characteristic chi k is equal to this sum q equals zero to m minus one to the q alpha sub q, where what? What's alpha q equal to? <coughs> the number of q's. What was that? Oh, the number of q simplexes. Okay, huh? Huh. 
<laughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah. So that's the number of zero simplexes, the number of one simplexes, the number of two simplexes. So this is, this is, this is, this is, I tried. <coughs> Go on here. So the theorem, and here's, so like that, that's just a definition, right? Here's the theorem. Here's the connection with topology. If K is oriented, <coughs> should have come up with an abbreviation for that, like 20 minutes ago, simplicial. Complex. Actually, what I should have said is K is going to be an oriented simplicial complex. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor planning on my part, right? <coughs> um, of dimension M. Zen, the other Poincare characteristic of K, is also calculable, calculatable, sum Q equals 0 to M, minus 1 to the Q. The rank of the Qth homology group of K. Being, we have a theorem that says that these are free abelian, so that makes sense. You can calculate the rank of a free abelian group. Right? It's the number of copies of Z that appear in its decomposition. Um, I think, I think. That's fine, I'm sure. Ah. Let's see here. And I will. I was tempted to go through this proof, but I think I better not. Um, but that proof looks pretty accessible, right? It looks at the chain complex, and um, it looks like it's just yeah, you know, basically se sequence arguments and. What's the key thing here? How does he, how does he convert? How does he, how does he swap? How does he change from the number of Q simplexes to the rank of the, uh, of the homology group, I guess, is my main question in this proof. Mm -hmm. He relates them both to the ranks of uh, the cycles and the boundaries. Uh, oh, I see. So that exercise 5.5, .5, apparently. What's exercise 5.5 .5 say? I guess that's in chapter 5A. Eh? Is that right? That's right, right. Yeah. Right, 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 right. I think it just says you can... Uh Oh, that's, you got a short exact sequence, then the rank of B is equal to the rank of A plus the rank of C. And uh, if you have an exact sequence of finitely generated abelian group, then this alternating sum of the ranks has to be zero. Hmm. I guess we don't qualify for two. <laughs> okay. So we must be using one of 5.5 .5 there. I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. was I. Now I've lost my place. No. <laughs> it's on page 146. Ah, thank you. Much appreciated. <coughs> so that's how he, he connects the... Well, I guess the fact that alpha Q is the rank of CQK is that's just counting, right? Like, what's the rank of CQK? What is the CQK? Is oh, yeah, well, the basis is all the. kind of like linearly independent. So the, the basis. So each, each, each. the basis is attached. There's one element of the basis attached to each Q simplex. Mm -hmm. So the rank of Q, CQK is the number of Q simplexes. Right. 
and then the quality there is the exercise 5.5. All right, I'm starting to go down the path of proving this. Let me stop. Um, <clears throat> and then he uh, he presents next uh, excision uh, for subcomplexes of simplicial complex. So you get excision again. You get the Mayer via torus result for simplicial complexes, right? <laughs> it's like <laughs> same stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now he's going to compare with singular homology in his next section here. I will not be writing much. Um, and um, let's see here, let me get to the point basically here. It's the same thing. For the most part, there's something sneaky that goes on in here though. Um, it's 4 o'clock p.m. Get to it here. Let's see, let's read this. Let me read his main results. Definition He has an oriented simplicial complex. And he what does he do? <coughs> he defi he puts tildes on things. <coughs> defines an augmented complex instead of reduced, which which starts at minus uh, one. And then next he says that he defines the re the reduced simplicial homology groups to be the um, homology groups of the augmented complex. <laughs> and uh, and then he has that. If K is the simplicial complex consisting of all faces of an N simplex, uh, whose vertex set is a linearly ordered. So the uh, basically, if you have the underlying space is the N simplex, right? Then the reduced homology groups are zero for all Q greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Then corollary 17.19. If he has k, all the faces of an oriented n simplex so that the vertices of k are linearly ordered, let L be the subcomplex of all proper faces. So that so he's looking at the subcomplex that the underlying space gives S on, gives the space um, homeomorphic to um, the n minus 1 sphere. Then he gets the reduced homology groups of the subcomplex um, are 0. If Q is not equal to n minus 1, and it's Z, if Q is equal to n minus 1, I feel like we've seen that before. And then he's got this Mayer via torus with singular homology. What's going on here? Oh, the answers. Um, let's see here. So finally, theorem 7.22 after some work, right, he gets to this result. For every oriented finite simplicial complex K, the chain map, J, from the reduced, reduced, um, excuse me, the augmented complex of K to the um, reduced, or is that augmented? <coughs> I forget what the S tilde is. <coughs> um, uh, the underlying space of K induces isomorphisms for all Q greater than zero that the reduced homology of K, the Qth reduced homology of K, is isomorphic to the Qth reduced homology of the underlying space of K. Which is to say that the simplicial maps calculate homology for the underlying topological spaces which they form, which they, you know, form a simplicial approximation of. So I guess on the left is um, the simplicial yeah, homology we just find, and on the right is the singular homology. Right, we've got we got chapter seven. <coughs> chapter seven meets chapter four. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Now, um, he gets this corollary, seven point two three, x be a polyhedron having triangulariz triangulizations, k h and k prime h prime, <coughs> then guess what? The Q homology group of K is isomorphic to the Q homology group of K prime. Yay! Proof by hypothesis. Blah blah blah. It's like two lines. Um, corollary: If X is a polyhedron of dimension m, then the Q homology group of X is free is a free group for Q greater than zero. Excuse me. Finitely, finitely generated. Blah, blah. It is also free. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
I thought it was. Let's be greedier though. Finally generated. Um, H. I mean, telling somebody that the, they're working with a free group isn't all that freeing. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it depends on what you're looking for in your life. They're trying to find results or not. Yeah. Like, do you like to have decisions made for you, or <laughs> do you like freedom? I don't know. So I don't see here. Um, free groups are like the wild west of algebra, right? I mean, it's just like, anyway, okay, I digress. Um, the qth homology group of x is zero. Again, x is a polyhedron of dimension m for all q larger than m, and then the mth homology group of the polyhedron of dimension m is free abelian. So that, that basically is coming, that's very analogous to this theorem we had earlier for the oriented simplex of dimension m. Right now we're talking about polyhedra. Um, corollary, um, if k is an oriented simplicial complex, then the qth homology group is independent of the orientation. Okay. Um, if x is a polyhedron with triangularization, k comma h, then the euler poincare characteristic is independent of the triangularization. Oh, that's very mm. cool. So it doesn't matter how you calculate it. If you calculate it in one triangularization, you've calculated it in all, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and the proof, he says, just combine theorems 7.22 and 7.15. So, yeah, so 7.22 was that chapter 4 of each chapter 7 result. You can replace the homology of the oriented complex with the homology, the reduced homology of the underlying space. And then theorem 7.15, which he's also using, is, what was that? That was the... Oh, that's just the... So you can almost see the proof if you just read those two theorems, right? What you do is you take the Euler characteristic, <coughs> which is built over the simplicial over the simplicial homology groups, you swap those out for the reduced homology groups. Then, since the reduced homology groups are equal to the simplicial homology groups of the other triangularization, I mean the other simplex, then you can you can you get back to the the Euler characteristic calculated from another simplicial complex. So I mean that it's proof even I understand, sort of. All right, um, where was I? I lost track. <coughs> Oh, 152. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Check this out. This, this, this paragraph here makes you stop and go, <coughs> what? One last comment before proceeding. First attempts to prove corollary 7.23, all right, were aimed at the polyhedron itself. Um, <clears throat> for many years, once tried to prove the Hapvermanut. Uh, through the principle of conjecture. Um, if K, H, and L, G are triangularizations of a polyhedron X, then there are subdivisions, not necessarily very eccentric, K prime of K and L prime of L, with K prime... Um, what should that... What should I say there? It's isomorphic. isomorphic to L prime. Right, I got something similar. <clears throat> I think they use the language equivalent, though. But equivalent? Yeah. Hmm. Were this true there would be an easy proof of the topological invariance of the homology groups of the simplicial complex. And then, and this is, so, was it Moise or Moz or, I don't know how to say that, M-O-I-S-E, proved it for n equals 3, but then Milner, in 61, constructed counterexamples to it for every n greater than or equal to 6. The more you read about what Milner did, and the more you, you, you go on and you understand what, who, who John Milner is and what he's done, you, you gain tremendous respect for this, this, the mathematics that he's done. It's, it's really... I had the opportunity to study, you know, review a paper that Tom wrote, and uh, it was all basically piggybacking off this paper that Milner wrote in the early 70s, and like, uh, it's just so clear what he did. So, I mean, basically just amounted to algebra over what, what he'd done, but like, you know, Mil Miller's work is very pretty. And some of the deepest stuff he did when he did when he was like 19. 
Anyway, um, I don't think he stopped being productive at that age either, though. I mean, he's still, I don't know what he's up to now, but. Uh, okay. So he's got some, he's got a definition of <coughs> the, um, excuse me, the wedge of two spaces. You take two spaces that are pointed, the wedge of them, you take the, basically glue the points together and form the disjoint union. So it's like a dis, mostly disjoint union, except the base points, which you identify. So that's the wedge of two spaces. And there's some nice, like that, mostly I think is for the sake of assigning you guys exercise 7.26, right? Hmm. <laughs> K1 and K2 polyhedra. Then the anthemology of the wedge of K1 and K2 is the isomorphic <coughs> the direct sum of the homologies of the polyhedra. That is cool, right? That's really. The wedge is associative. Hmm. These are very pretty results. All right. Um. All right. Let's see here. Getting to something. Oh man. This chapter's wearing me down, guys. I'm trying to get over here. What I wanted to get to. Calculations. Was not calcul. The calculations. 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 Let us talk about the calculations. <laughs> <coughs> I mean, granted. Fundamental theorem. <coughs> so first is fundamental theorem is, is a brief tour into about three weeks of the 422 <coughs> course, if, if all goes as planned. Basically, he's like, if you got a free billion group, you can, you can write it as the direct sum, excuse me, a finitely generated abelian group. Mm -hmm. Eventually I'll get it, Daniel. Um, and a finally generated abelian group can be written as a direct sum of a free abelian group and a torsion piece, right? Um, so it's a, the torsion piece is a direct sum of cyclic groups, and they can be arranged so that their orders, B sub I, are, are, are dividing. One divides the next, divides the next, divides the next, divides the next, divides the next. Get the idea. These are the torsion, coefic tors torsion coefficients of G. Um, and this decomposition is useful in the sense that it can identify when two finitely generated abelian groups are in fact isomorphic. In particular, the rank and <coughs> the rank of the, the, the rank of the free piece and the torsion coefficients are invariants of G. So if you have two finitely generated abelian groups, they're isomorphic if and only if they have the same rank and the same torsion coefficients. Um, and so he goes on to explain basically how this is connected to um, the normal form of a matrix over the integers. And um, like he says here, the Smith normal form, every rectangular matrix D over the integers can be transformed using elementary row and column operations into a normal form. This normal form is independent of the elementary operations and is uniquely determined by, by D. The Smith normal form is sort of the module equivalent of the um, rational canonical form I covered last semester because I'm an idiot. Um, anyway, why waste my time? I don't know. Anyway, for any oriented simplicial complex K, there is an algorithm to compute the Qth homology group over the oriented simplex. He sketches the, well, I mean, we can read through it. So CQK is a free abelian group, right? It's got a finite basis of oriented simplexes. You got these boundary maps that go from one CQK to the next, right? And um, so it determines a matrix with entries either 0, 1, or minus 1. And uh, you can let NQ be the Smith normal form of DQ. And um, so. He connects then the uh, particulars of the matrix to the specific topological data, you know, the Betty number. What do we say here? The qth Betty number of k is CQ minus RQ plus 1, and the torsion coefficients of HQK are those B1Q to the BKQK that are distinct from 1. I don't know, I can't 
I'd have to really sit and dwell on this, but he basically he and he he has no intention actually of of executing this algorithm for examples. Let me show you. So example seven point twelve. He said we give an explicit triangulation of the torus, dimension k equal to two. So if alpha q denotes the number of q simplexes in k, then alpha two is eighteen. How many alpha one? <coughs> Twenty seven, that's how many edges, I guess. And oh wait a minute. Other way around. That twenty eight uh, excuse me, 18 vertices, 20, 27 edges, is that right? And nine faces, I guess. I thought it was in the right nine part. vertices, 27. Oh, okay. I, I'm sorry, I, it's Euler's formula, it's, it's a bad influence on me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, 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 so. <sighs> All right, so H. So H2X is free abelian. Since X is path connected, we have that H not X is, is, is the integers. The Euler characteristic of K is 9 minus 27 plus 18 equals 0. So that 1 plus the rank of H2X equals the rank of H1X. Hmm. Huh. So he says to complete the computation using the algorithm, we need to examine the matrices of boundary 2 and boundary 1. Uh, the first is 18 by 27, and the second one is 27 by 9. <laughs> it says, um, so yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> That's basically what it says. <laughs> and then, all right, so the next few pages are devoted towards um, developing yet another notion of sort of... Uh, I don't know if I want to say triangulation. It's what he calls the... What's he call it here? Cell decomposition? The what? Small decomposition? Cell? He, call, he says the subcomplex E of the chain complex E is adequate um, given these couple conditions and then he says, if E prime is an adequate subcomplex of of E for every Q, the map is an isomorphism. So basically, you can you can calculate the homology by using an adequate an adequate sum complex. Adequate sum complexes do not are not subject to the rules and conditions that are uh, you know are oriented sim oriented simplex were. So like, let me show you some calculations calculations in the adequate sum adequate sub complex. These calculations I think are actually doable. So I'm skipping ahead here, basically, to page uh, 162. And this is what I've seen. This is what I saw when Min was studying um, the topology of compact two manifolds. That's what it was, compact two manifolds. It's all this stuff. I mean, there are other books that blow this material up into like 100, 150 pages. This like two pages here. I think the, um, I want to say the book Topological Manifolds by, I think it might be in the Topological Manifolds by Lee book. I don't think I have that here. But anyway, let's see if we can make sense of this. <clears throat> Hey, how awesome would it be if I told Calc2 that we're not meeting tomorrow? That would make Calc2 very happy. Yes. That would make you very happy, too. Hmm. <laughs> <coughs> so we'll meet electronically tomorrow. I'll send a suggestion. I mean, I do have a whole other semester of Calculus 2 videotapes. <laughs> I probably should meet with them. I'm, sh I'm sure they need it. But you're right, it would make me happy. <laughs> That's a your example. <laughs> I hope we can figure this one out together. Um, so, X is the torus. And he's going to draw this picture.
And so you've got Yeah. He says, note, in this case, all the vertices, the corners of the square, are identified to a common vertex. What's an adequate subcomplex is obtained the adequate subcomplex obtained above has the chains as follows. So let's see if we can make sense of this. E2 is P. E1 is A plus B. E0 is V. So we're, let me ask a, as usual, dumb question. What's P? The square. Oh, P's everything. Oh, oh, like he says. <laughs> I can't read. Yes. Uh, opposite, so this, the square is P. So this whole thing is P, basically, right? Um, so there's one face, P. There's edges. What are the edges? A and B, right? And there's a vertex. So far, so good. And then he says, the differentiation, what's the boundary of P is what? I guess I can see it. <laughs> it's A minus B minus A plus B, isn't it? I just cheated and looked at the picture, but I know that's not rigorous. <laughs> but how, how is that differentiation? I mean, the differentiation should be decided by the by the rules, you know. And I think that's equivalent, like, so P is, what is P formed by? Whoa, it's a ghost. Or as Isaac says, ghost is. I mean, no one is there. Well, anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move along here, because I want to get to the, so that's zero. Oh, it's okay, I'll just leave it open for a second. Um, so that's the, I think that would just be sorting through this, right? I just don't, huh. I guess I have to accept, to properly understand this, I have to read the previous four pages. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have to be a little bit formal here, sorry about that. Um, the boundary of A is what? The boundary of A is V minus V, which is zero. I guess the boundary of V is also the same. And finally the boundary, boundary V, well, that's zero. So, let's see here, how does he calculate? So Z2 should be what? Z2 should be the kernel of the two bound of the boundary, right? Which is everything. Which is, everything. Which is what? Everything since the boundary of P is zero. So that's just so it's uh, just P. I guess. So you can't have a bound, I mean, there's nothing to be, P doesn't appear as the boundary of something else, so the, 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 the B, B2 here is zero. Um, Z1 should be what? That should be the kernel. And so you get A and B is both in there, so that's just... Right. 
right? And well, this is rather boring. Sorry, this is not a terribly exciting example. Um, and then z naught is v, and all about. So, oh man, this is <laughs> this is funny. So in this case, <laughs> so like the cycles are the homology here, right? I mean, like. If I understand correctly, yes. so H2. Now, why is it equal to Z though? Because, I mean, this is like the brackets P, it's at the. Oh, so we have one thing. Yeah. So this is Z. And then, so H, H1 is Z. Is it Z? Z? Yeah, okay, so Z plus Z for this one. And H2. Z again, H not rather, Z again, right? So. Hmm. Alright, let's try another one. Hopefully I have time. Alright, I have time, I have time. Alright, so. I'll go with the square picture. <laughs> so he's got A, which we identify with, oh, that's twisted. And then, oh, whoa. this is all. It's all messed up. Yeah. This is a uh, W. W. Oh, two. We got two vertices now. Very exciting. All right. <laughs> I'm assuming that's still P. So let's see here, if I can understand this formally. E2 is going to be P. E1 <coughs> is going to be A plus B again, right? And E not, I mean, nothing changes in terms of the, the big scheme of things. It's still the same adequate subcomplex, but the, um, the boundary map is different this time. So let's see here, partial, basically partial two acting on on the on P is what it's. Um, I guess I really should say it acts on this, doesn't it? I'm, I'm to be more moderately more picky. It doesn't. I mean, this isn't quite. I mean, the boundary. Well, I don't know. I haven't studied it carefully enough to know if that's actually a transgression or not. You know, without brackets, with brackets. Anyway, the boundary P should be what? It should be... Well, like, when they write boundary P, that's like the element P. So... Oh. Uh, really, like, you, know, you don't take the boundary of the whole Yeah, group. you're right, you're right. Thank you, thank you. So, let's see here. If I had to guess, it's going to be B plus A minus B minus A. So it's still zero? No. No? No, because uh, yeah, yeah, I'm wrong. Okay, because what? Because the orientations all go the same way. Or... Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. Exactly. Thank you. So it's actually two two a plus two b. All right. And let's see here. What's the boundary of a? Boundary of A should be, I think, B minus W? Or is it W minus V? W minus V. Alright. So the boundary of V, so now that you now that you fix that for me. If that's W minus V, <laughs> then this must be V minus W, right? Boundary of B, mm -hmm. V minus W. Okay, so the kernel. Uh, 